Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar of, of today, which is about development of millet value chains and processing. We have uh, three exciting presentations and time for discussion uh, after each of those and, and at the end. Uh, so I, I hope you're all, uh, like I, looking forward to some very interesting uh, conversations and, and learning some new aspects uh, about this very important uh, work. Uh, I understand that we do have available some uh, simultaneous interpretations, so you should be able to find translation into one or two uh, languages anyway, if, if you would appreciate having that. Uh, as, as some of you will know, because uh, many of you joined uh, our webinar of two months ago, uh, that, that webinar, we had three uh, presentations on un unleashing the power of millets. Uh, Dr. Mariam Dawood from the Lake Chad Research Institute in Nigeria, uh, Dr. Mahalingan Govindarash from uh, Alliance Biodiversity SIAT, uh, and Dr. Harish Gandhi uh, from CIMIT. Uh, shared with us their experiences, and we had some some lively discussion, uh, especially at the end uh, of of those presentations. So today we we hope to have three. We're still waiting for for one of our speakers, uh, and that's our first. That would have been our first speaker, Dr. Dayakar Rao, uh, is still struggling to connect. Uh, and to to not keep all of us waiting, what we will do is we will go ahead. Uh, and proceed with, with the other speakers. And uh, hopefully, uh, Dr. Dayakar Rao will join us uh, in the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes, uh, whilst we hear from, uh, first of all, from Professor uh, Daniel Ndakasila. Uh, and Dr. Daniel Ndakasila is an um, associate professor at Jomo Kenyatta University uh, here in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. Uh, he's the principal of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, at the Jomo Kenyatta University. He's currently project manager for our European Union funded initiative on food fortification in Kenya, which is a collaboration between the, the university and the Ministry of Health. I'm sorry, there's an interruption um, from one of our organizers. Is, is there a problem or shall I continue? Uh, apologies, I think that was an inadvertent uh, interruption. So as I was saying, Professor Daniel Dacasila uh, is at the Jomo Kenyatta University. Uh, he's uh, or coordinating several projects, including coordinator of the VLIR UOS funded Legume Center of Excellence for Food and Nutrition Security. He's currently coordinating the Kenya National Food Fortification Alliance which is a multi-sectorial initiative that brings together the government, milling industries, academia, and several premix suppliers. Uh, he was awarded the Jomo Kenyatta University Chancellor's Research Merit Award for Exceptional Resource Mobilization. So um, he's a, a, an expert resource mobilizer. Uh, and uh, Daniel, we invite you to share with us your experience and very much look forward to hearing from you. So over to you, uh, Dr. Daniel Ndakasila. Thank you very much, Prixley, and a uh, big pleasure to be here today. But uh, we have organized ourselves in such a way that uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Sarah Wairimu, Dr. Sarah Wairimu, to initiate the presentation, and I'll come in as the second presenter. So I'll request uh, Dr. Sarah Wairimo to start us off, and then I will come in between uh, Sarah and uh, Francisca. Sarah, over to you. Okay, it's good to oh, always be you. agile and on our feet. So let, let me introduce Sarah. Uh, Sarah Kariuki uh, is a markets and value chain specialist at CIMIT, uh, also based here in Kenya. Uh, her research is mainly on cereal seed systems, uh, especially uh, specifically the demand for newer and improved varieties. Uh, her other lines of work include research on how food markets can be made more efficient and assessment of consumer demand for higher quality and safer foods. Uh, she holds her PhD from uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And um, Sarah, we look forward to hearing from you, uh, Dr. Kariuki. Over to you. Okay.
All right, thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining this webinar and also thanks to the organizers for giving us a chance to present on uh, one of our projects, which is being done here in Kenya in collaboration with our partners uh, from the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. So uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Can Blending with Flour with Sorghum and Millet Contribute to the Development of Millet and Sorghum Value Chains? Uh, and uh, work is based here in Kenya, so this is uh, a Kenyan case study. So I, sorry, I, I don't know that everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Yes, we can, Sarah. Okay. Uh, just a minute. Um... All right, so as a way to motivate uh, what you are doing, uh, here we show the consumption patterns for five major cereals in the East African region. And also we zoom in, in Kenya, uh, for Kenya because that's where we carried out our study. And so we show the trends of consumption of five major cereals uh, over time. Uh, what we show here is the per capita consumption for uh, maize to start with, and we see that maize still plays an important role in people's diets, still remains to be the major uh, cereal that is consumed by consumers in this region. And uh, But we see some declining trend in terms of uh, per capita consum uh, consumption, especially in the recent years. Now, if you look at... Uh, the yellow and the gray lines, this is wheat and rice respectively. Uh, we see that over time, the per capita consumption for rice and wheat in the region uh, has gone up, is in, on an upward trend, and we find a similar pattern for the case of Kenya. Uh, lastly, when you look at uh, the orange and the, light, the dark blue uh, graphs, where, which shows the per capita consumption for Millets for sorghum and millet, we show uh, we see a downward trend in terms of consumption of uh, millet and sorghum over time, uh, and this is also evident in the Kenyan case, where actually consumption of millet and uh, wheat is, I mean millet and sorghum is quite low. So some of the factors that uh, are associated with these changes in people's consumption patterns are urbanization, uh, things like increasing incomes, and also changes um, or increasing opportunity costs of men and women's time that make consumers uh, prefer convenience foods like bread and uh, wheat related products. So, Sorry. All right. So on the other hand, when you zoom in to wheat, um, and here we want to show the trends in wheat uh, supply, that is production and uh, net imports versus consumption. And uh, I give wheat as an example, uh, because that's what uh, our project is about. And both for East African region and for Kenya, and we see that the increasing uh, rate of consumption, so the, the dotted line shows the total consumption is increasing for wheat, but the production, which is shown by the dark gray uh, bar at the, uh, at the bottom is not increasing at the same rate. So meaning the rate at which uh, consumption of wheat and wheat-based products in the region is increasing at a faster rate uh, compared to the local production. And that means that the proportion of imports of the total wheat that is consumed in the region is increasing. Uh, and if you look at the case of Kenya, actually the local production has stagnated. And so the gap between, uh, or rather the, the proportion of imports uh, plays a more important role compared to what is produced locally. So this uh, raises the question of uh, 
countries in this region over relying on imports for an important uh, staple crop. And so one thinks about um, implications of this uh, situation, like we have a country relying on imports for an important crop. And so in case of supply shocks in the producing countries, you find uh, this affects local prices, like what happened recently with the UK, I mean, with the Ukraine-Russia crisis. And also in some cases, we find that the importing countries impose uh, tariffs and import bans in a way to protect their local consumption. So this, all this affects uh, the importing countries and this can be uh, detrimental if the countries are depending on imports for their main uh, consumption. But another way of looking at this, at the increasing consumption uh, of local, of wheat and wheat-based products, is looking at it as an opportunity to also bring in uh, millet and sorghum into people's diets without necessarily changing their preferences or without necessarily presenting them with different products. And so that's why researchers and even governments are thinking about blending wheat flour with or replacing a proportion of uh, wheat flour in wheat-based products with sorghum and millet, and so the main objective would be one to rely uh, to reduce the overdependence on imports, but also to boost the demand for millet and sorghum without necessarily uh, changing people's diets. So people still get the same convenient products like bread, uh, and so this will this is hypothesized to affect. Um, uh, the rest of the value chains, you know, making it more attractive for the investors, for the private sector to invest into uh, sorghum and millet processing. And also this eventually is hypothesized to crowd, uh, crowd in the adoption of improved varieties at the production level that would then increase the yields and uh, in the long run in, uh, reduce the prices of sorghum and millet, which are currently higher than that of wheat and, uh, and uh, maize. So, and for those who have been here in Kenya, there's this conversation by the government trying to push uh, the private sector of the millers towards blending uh, both wheat and maize flour with sorghum and millet. Uh, and the other added advantages, uh, for example, you can uh, think of nutritional benefits by adding in millet and sorghum, which are more nutritious. And also another advantage would be uh, diversification in uh, current times of climate change. So uh, farmers, um, and this is because millet and sorghum are considered as uh, more drought tolerant uh, compared to maize and wheat. So, one question remains uh, whether or how commercially viable is blending of wheat flowers with other crops. Uh, and you can think about uh, bringing in a proportion of uh, or replacing a proportion of uh, wheat with millet and sorghum that is likely to affect the functional uh, properties of wheat and also the physical properties of uh, with best products, uh, and also you can think about consumers and how they are going to uh, react to these changes uh, in uh, the composition of the flour that is used to make uh, bread-based products. And so that is what uh, we do in this study. We look into these two questions. Uh, one is how does uh, replacing a portion of wheat with millet and sorghum affect the functional properties of wheat? during baking and during chapati making. Uh, how does that affect the physical properties of the products made from uh, blends? For example, when you think of bread, is it that, that how much does the color change? How much, uh, how much does the volume change and things like that? And then after that, we think about uh, how do consumers uh, um, evaluate such products. Do, do they still uh, like the products? Are they able to tell whether there are sensory differences? And so that is what this project does. And so now I'm going to invite Professor Sila, who will take us briefly through the first stage of the project, which is um, the lab analysis 
on the physical and the functional properties of uh, wheat and wheat-based products after adding the blends. And then after that, I'll invite my colleague here in CIMIT uh, to take us through what consumers feel about the blended products. Thank you. So over to Professor Sila. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you, Presley, for opening this meeting for us. I want to thank the CIMIT team for inviting us to be part of this, going straight to why we are here. The approach we took is that we were replacing wheat flour with the proportions of our sorghum and millet at 5%, 10%, and 20%, and using the 100% wheat flour to consider is as the control or to look at the really 100%, how does this affect the functional properties? So we looked at uh, five aspects. We looked at the changes in the nutritional properties. We looked at the physical properties of the new product. We looked at the baking performance of the uh, bread and also for chapati, the likability of the chapati. We looked at sensory uh, characteristics in two forms, students, uh, sensory test using a nine point adonic scale and the consumer test at a five point adonic scale. Next. Sarah, you can push to the next slide. So this is part of the nutritional lab we have within our university. It's showing the nutritional performance uh, characteristics here, where we are looking for protein analysis. And on the right side here, our size exclusion chromatography. Here, our extensor graph. And uh, lastly here, the unit which is used for fat and uh, protein analysis digestion. Next. So uh, clearly going to the nutritional properties of millet and considering the macronutrients at the same moisture content, you can see here 100% uh, wheat flour and 100% uh, millet. Uh, when you have 100% uh, wheat flour, the refined wheat flour is a very low ash content. Uh, when you consider the millet 100%, you have um, uh, almost three times more uh, ash content, which is the total mineral content. So by increasing uh, the concentration or replacing wheat flour with 5% millet, we start seeing an, in, uh, an increase uh, from the original uh, wheat flour towards uh, higher numbers for ash content up to 20%. So slight increases in the mineral content as indicated by the ash. A similar trend is seen with the crude fat. Uh, we, reduce, we remove always the jam, but when you look at the whole meal millet, uh, any slight increase also led to incremental changes of um, the crude fat content. The protein content remained similar because uh, the protein content of the wheat flour we used and uh, that of millet were of similar characteristics. And when it comes to crude fiber, you are also really increasing the amount of uh, available crude fiber or digestible fiber within uh, the product, which is actually a good thing. This similar trend was also seen with the replacing wheat flour with sorghum, but here we clearly depict what happened with this uh, palm millet. Next. So we also looked at uh, how does this replacement uh, affect the functional properties? And here we are showing the work coming from uh, extensor graph, which clearly indicates the flour elasticity behavior. We did this at 45 minutes, 90 minutes, and uh, 135 minutes. And the red uh, indicates 80% um, wheat flour and 20% millet. In all the cases, the three cases, you see the 80% at the lowest elasticity, while the highest is at 100% um, wheat flour. So any small increase, uh, I mean replacement of wheat flour affected the uh, the dough extensibility properties uh, negatively, meaning that uh, bread volume was affected when you are dealing with bread. This might not be the case when you're looking at chapati because in chapati, volume is not important really, but for bread uh, performance, any small or slight increase or replacement of uh, uh, wheat flour with millet or sorghum uh, resulted to reduction in the elasticity properties which affect the baking performance. There, we saw promising results up to 10%, which could actually allow us to be able to use uh, wheat flour uh, blended with the millet or sorghum up to 10%. Next. 
Next. This here is indicated here for millet. You can see the control, which is 100% wheat flour. 5% is looks uh, quite similar in terms of both the cramp and crust structure. But when it comes to 20%, there is a significant reduction, which was noticeable, meaning that moving beyond 10%, you are compromising the bread volume, which is of very important, very big significance when it comes to selection of product. And this is for the same weight of wheat flour. Next. Uh, this is a similar trend here shown for sorghum, and we're using white sorghum here. From the control up to 10%, we don't see any significant differences in terms of visual perspectives, but the bread volume significantly reduced at 20% uh, replacement. Next. Uh, this here is indicated here where we have the control for both sorghum uh, and millet. So at 5%, you can see it's very close to what you see in uh, the control, but the moment you reach uh, 10%, you start seeing a noticeable difference, which is not really star clear uh, until, until you measure the volume. But as you get to 20%, you can see for sorghum, this is uh, slightly uh, higher, but uh, for millet, this is uh, too significantly noticeable. So this means the protein characteristics for both sorghum and millet are different, but both of them could uh, easily be used uh, in blending wheat flour up to 10% with the without significant difference. But with the addition of enzymes or with the flour improvers, this could significantly change. What you are seeing here is a significant change can be reversed with addition of uh, uh, flour improvers, of which we did not do in this particular case. Next. We went to sensory analysis among students here and we used about 55 students and we looked uh, back, please. So we looked at the sensory characteristics for millet on the left hand side and the uh, um, sensory characteristics for uh, sorghum based product. We looked at appearance, aroma, text and overall acceptance. And on overall expect, uh, acceptance, you can see there are no noticeable differences until you get to 20% when we consider the millet flour, but they could see differences in appearance. They could see differences, slight, slight differences in aroma, uh, but minimal in texture. But when it comes to 20%, this clearly becomes stark uh, conspicuous and they can realize everything from appearance all the way to texture. A similar trend here is seen for sorghum-based blends. Uh, and you see reduction always from 100% wheat flour all the way to 20% sorghum. And uh, the overall acceptance also kept on decreasing slightly with the changing concentration of the blend. This also is very clear. When we did sensory uh, substitution up to 10%, you realize that the sensorial characteristics are not negatively affected largely up to 10%. But when you go beyond this, 20% becomes uh, uh, no go zone. Similar results were also seen for chapati uh, when we considered the sorghum and millet blends. Next. So the take home message here is that uh, we wanted to demonstrate that you can blend. And we have seen that both 10, uh, up to 10% uh, millet and sorghum blends, we have promising results actually for inclusion of this in bread and chapati making. We went uh, outside this into a consumer test and worked with about 1,871 consumers to really check whether we can confirm the best performing blend out of this, uh, whether they would reflect the same within uh, the market. And this is an example, an interview being done within the market. And now I will uh, invite Francisca to present the results of that second part. Francisca? Okay. Just, just for, for keeping time's sake, we only have about two more minutes remaining for the presentation. So. Uh, I hope we can we can uh, wrap up uh, fairly quickly. Oh, back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so for the consumer testing at the streets, uh, we intercepted 1,871 consumers coming from the supermarkets in the peri-urban areas of Nairobi. And we divided the, uh, the consumers into two groups. One, of the groups had um, the information on the components 
on the components of the flower and the other uh, group did not have information on the composition of the flour that was used to make these products. So for the case of chapati, um, without the information, um, on average, 71% uh, of consumers liked uh, the chapati made from a blend of wheat and millet and 73% uh, um, liked the blends, uh, the chapati from a blend of wheat and sorghum. And this was uh, slightly higher than the proportion of the percentage of consumers who liked the chapati made from uh, wheat only. Uh, and for the group that had information, uh, we see that um, the percentage of consumers who liked uh, the blend, the chapati made from wheat and millet, um, increased significantly from 71% to 80%. Um, that shows that uh, with information on what uh, on the composition of the products, consumers tend to like the products more. Um, and we see the same trend also for bread. Um, on average, more than uh, above 60% of consumers uh, liked the products, both uh, for the wheat only products and also the blends for millet and sorghum. Um, without the information, um, bread made from a blend of either sorghum or uh, millet was liked less compared to the uh, bread made from wheat only, which is what people are used to. But on the information group, uh, we see a significant change in the percentage of consumers who like um, the bread made from a blend of wheat and millet, while um, the one for sorghum slightly goes up, but not, uh, not a great difference. Um, yeah. So what does this uh, have, what is the implication of this work? Uh, from our study, we can see that uh, it's possible to substitute up to 10% of wheat with either millet or sorghum, and this 10% uh, translates to um, 200,000 metric tons of wheat per year, and uh, this could be either through a double supply, doubling the total supply of millet or um, increasing or, or the 200% 200,000 metric tons could also represent the annual supply for sorghum currently in the country. So um, this is to show that we can still um, have this substitution without a great compromise on the uh, preferences of consumers and to achieve higher substitution rates, which is greater than 10%. This could also be done, but with uh, increasing the use of the flower enzymes and which improve us. So the questions that uh, we ask ourselves now, uh, which poses the next areas of research is how to increase the farm yields in order to bring down the prices as the prices of millet and sorghum um, are still higher compared to the current prices of wheat. Um, and also the other question we ask is whether there is a scope for public policy to steer private sector towards uh, blending as the uh, wheat milling is mostly done by the private sector. So we would need the public policy to, um, to push these private companies or the millers to blending. Um, we acknowledge um, the CGR initiative, said equal for funding this project and also to submit and Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francisca and Dinda, and of course, uh, also Dr. Kariuki and Dr. Sila. Uh, really very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I'd like to remind all participants, please use the Q&A function. There, at, the, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a tab, Q&A, where you can type in your questions or comments for the panelists. Um, we, we will go to our third speaker now, uh, but we have 10 minutes for Q&A uh, reserved at the end uh, of the presentations. Uh, so I would like to move now to invite Dr. Uh, Dayakar Rao. Uh, Dr. Dayakar Rao uh, is a seasoned agricultural researcher. 
He has more than three decades of experience in processing, value addition, marketing, and policy and entrepreneurship. Um, he is credited with piloting successful millet value chain ecosystems with end-to-end -end solutions that create demand for millets. He's now leading a project called Nutri Hub, which is a technology business incubator, and he's made significant contributions to developing and strengthening millet processing and value addition uh, at the ICAR Indian Institute of Millets Research, or IIMR. He has several patents, uh, numerous publications, and he has mentored more than 400 startups uh, at the Nutri Hub, uh, which I hope we're going to hear more about in, in his presentation. Uh, Dr. Dayakar has received numerous uh, awards, uh, and he's, well, and most recently he received a, a Leader with a Strategic Vision Award uh, under the Agribusiness Summit and Agriculture Awards uh, 2021. So without taking any more of his time, I would like to thank and welcome Dr. Dayakar Rao to, to share your experience and your um, presentation with us. Over to you, uh, Dr. Dayakar. I see your presentation, but I don't hear you. Dr. Dayakar, we're not we're not hearing you. Perhaps you are muted. Bear with us just a moment. Let's hope that we can sort out this technical challenge. Uh, I, I'm sure we're all very much looking forward to hearing uh, from Dr. Dayakar Rao. Hi, uh, Dr. Oh, Dayakar, sure. maybe, maybe you need to, to change the microphone device on your laptop. While we wait uh, for Dr. Dayakar to get connected, let me ask one of the, one question that came in for the previous uh, group, the group previous panelists. Um, the, the question for you is that in your presentation, you mentioned that the wheat flour uh, was refined flour. So the question is, were the sorghum and millet flours also refined flours that you used in the blends? Uh, Presley, uh, I can indicate clearly that uh, the wheat flour was re refined, whereas the millet and sorghum were whole milk. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And perhaps that might have affected also some of the results, but I thought it was a great question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's just check in once more with Dr. Dayakar. Are you able to talk to us now? It seems we're still having difficulties. Uh, let's see, we have one other question here. Um, what type is, of millet was used for blending? Was it pearl millet or finger millet or some other type or types of millet? Uh, clearly, again, here we used pearl millet for the blending work. Okay, did you use only one variety or did you use several varieties? One variety, we sourced all the... Uh, flour from one company, so we request one batch of palm millet to be used for all the applications. So we milled once, and this is the flour we used for all the applications. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, I think going forward, you know, as we see so much variation, even among wheat for extensibility, for example, the next step might be to start looking at what diversity is there that we could select to improve perhaps the millet or the sorghum uh, as well for use in blends. But uh, certainly for, for these initial studies, this is um, a reasonable approach uh, to have taken. Uh, let's see, Thank Professor you Dayakar, are you available now? 
it seems it seems he still hasn't resolved his issue. Uh, let me take a couple other questions. We have a, a couple more questions here that, um, let's see, from, from Dr. Sinoya Mukalipi. Oh, Dr. Dayakar, are you available now? I see your video is turned on. Hello? Hey, yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Can, hear. can you can you so, share your presentation? I, and uh, I just logged in it? mobile. I, we'll give priority so, to your presentation. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, this is Harish. Maybe Dr. Okay. Rao, you're able to share. Thank you. So are you able to see the screen now? It's coming, but we hear you. So that's a great start. Um, it says double click to enter full screen mode. I don't see your screen yet. We could see it a few minutes ago. Yeah, I, I cannot see your presentation yet. Okay, well, while we wait, we do have an interesting question from, from Zambia. Uh, asking whether, you know, since you're working on bread and um, and wheat with sorghum and millet, are there any plans to look at blending wheat with maize? Yeah, this is a possibility. I think the, quite a number of studies have been done in this area, but we need to initiate. Maize is the main uh, step of cereal within Kenya and probably within the East African region. So this could... Uh, present us with a potential area for looking at inclusion of uh, uh, maize flour in the wheat flour blaze, uh, based blends. But I think for this study, we were only concentrating on three uh, uh, cereals. That is um, sorghum, millet, and maybe one tuber, which is cassava. So the results for those three are available with us for now. Okay, thank you for that. You're right. I mean, I have seen earlier studies at blending maize with with, with wheat, so maybe this is much more novel uh, to look at the pearl millet and, and sorghums as well. The, the, um, let's see, Professor Dayakar, can you share your screen now? I, I don't see him anymore online. Uh, we did have a question earlier about the whether there's policy uh, in Kenya that would stimulate and, and uh, invite using such blends. Uh, I know a little bit about it, but maybe one of you, the presenters could tell us about uh, such policy. Hello. Uh, Kevin, I can also indicate that I also work with the Kenya National uh, Food Fortification Alliance. And part of uh, what has been done is that uh, we are supporting bladed flour. So the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Health have already defined standards for blended flour. So this is being voluntarily done by companies now and we are directing industries. And I think in the month of uh, November, there will be a government circular which will indicate uh, to what direction will blended flask uh, take within the industry. For now, I think voluntary, but probably in future they will come with, with more stringent measures in that direction. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. I think let's let's try I... once again. Dr. Dayakar, are you able to share your screen and, and talk to us? Hello. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, I hear you very well. Hello. Yes, go ahead. So there is a problem of uh, doing both the things together. Shall I speak uh, extempore? Yes, and maybe you can send email your presentation to Marian Aloch and she can share it. But then you yes, can go ahead and get started. Yeah. Okay. We need to say, share the presentation to Mary. Presentation is there. 
plus two five four. And we, we are running a little bit short of time, so if you could try to to talk to us in fifteen minutes, that would be great. Yes, yes. Uh, so it was uh, see the millets in India. You know there are traditional crops, especially out of. Uh, uh, what we are talking out of 11 millets, uh, I think nine millets are uh, very akin to India and then, and then the major and minor millets. But uh, I was associated with the Indian Institute of Millet Research for quite some time. More than Continuous decline for the value chain around that in 2007-8 with the funding, government funding, as well as the World Bank funding. And then try to understand the value chain. Uh, there was a value chain, but it was uh, disintegrated. But uh, a primary thing that which we need to understand here is that uh, the millets were primarily grown by the farmers for their own consumption. In today's context, there is as India is moving from food to nutrition security, with all the lifestyle diseases, micro, macro, nutrition problems that are really uh, with the uh, rice and wheat system, still we are not able to tackle them. So there is a great need for us to move towards the nutrition security. In this context, I think uh, the government uh, is very keen to promote millets, but uh, we have preempted research based in southern India. Uh, we came up with the building up a value chain. There were several gaps that are there. Millets It seems we have lost Dr. Dayaka. We don't hear you anymore. Big challenge. Yeah, apologies, colleagues. I, I can't hear Dr. Dayakar. It seems he's completely dropped uh, from the call. Um, so maybe maybe this this isn't going to happen. Uh, apologies to all of you. I know I was very much looking forward to hearing uh, from from our experienced uh, colleague, Dr. Dayakar Rao. But uh, obviously, technical difficulties are are interfering with the best of plans. Uh, so we will we will hope to bring him uh, on board for a, a future seminar. Uh, I think, uh, in the interest of time and and to respect everyone uh, on the call, uh, let's let's spend a few more minutes. Uh, discussing with our first uh, group of speakers. Uh, Dr. Dayakar, we, we keep losing you and, and, and not hearing what, what you're sharing with us. I'm, I'm very sorry uh, for these uh, difficulties. Uh, uh, and I very much appreciate, we all very much appreciate your efforts uh, to, to join us for this webinar. Uh, it, it looks like it's not going to be possible. Uh, so uh, my suggestion is that we, we invite you back uh, for another opportunity. Uh, and we use now, we have only only 10, 15 minutes remaining. Uh, probably we should ask some questions of our earlier speakers uh, and, and see if we can bring you back uh, and give you full time so that we can really hear from your rich experience uh, when we manage to solve these technical uh, issues. So with, with apologies to, to everyone and especially to you, Dr. Rao, uh, I, I would like now to, to have some more discussion uh, on the earlier uh, presentations that we heard uh, three very nice presentations uh, from uh, Dr. Kariuku, Dr. Um, Francisca, and also from uh, Dr. Sila uh, about the blending experiments. And we do have several questions that have come in for this team. Uh, so let me ask one or two of those. Uh, the first one is uh, asking about finger millet and, and, and why not consider finger millet, which is very much a, a nutritious and a very much favored grain uh, particularly in Kenya, but perhaps uh, more widely throughout Eastern Africa. So in, any thoughts about finger millet? Maybe that can be for Sarah uh, Kariuki. Uh, yes, um, 
but maybe we need to think more about it. Uh, the reason we, I know the reason we chose sorghum, it's, we chose white sorghum because of the color. We wanted something close to uh, uh, the wheat flour, which is white, because we were targeting the usual white products, uh, what we call the white bread. And uh, so I'm thinking the pearl millet, the decision was because of the color but I need to confirm that. So maybe Prof, you can confirm that. Is, is that the white one? Yes, Sarah, I think yeah, you are right. But also, Paul, uh, finger millet is a very small grain. And I think in cleaning and separation, when you come to large scale application, it causes much more trouble in separating when compared to uh, sorghum, for example, and uh, pearl millet. So our choice was largely driven by what we see in the market in terms of our white bread, a large proportion of white bread, and also some growing market for brown bread within the market. For chapati, I think we did not really see a big difference because after baking, we after cooking, you the color really changes very slightly. So largely because of the production volumes, uh, the possibility for cleaning technically, which actually makes some, uh, finger millet a big trouble. And it's one of the orphan crops of Kenya. Yeah. yeah. And, and also, this also came from one of the millers in the region. Uh, so that's why we started actually discussing with the millers uh, in terms of if you're to bring in another cereal into wheat uh, based products, what would be the consideration? So, color was one of them and all flavors. So, yeah, just to add on what Prof has, has said. Okay, thank you. I, I, it seems like there's some fans of finger millet on, on the webinar today, uh, and that's great, but there are also some fans of sorghum. So one comment here says that this was a wonderful presentation. Uh, it will be open more, it will open more market for sorghum uh, and for millets. And it, it, the question is, you know, you recommend 10% blend, uh, but really once there's more awen awareness, we want to increase uh, the, the content. And of course, we, we did see something from you about what, what increasing the concentrations does to the quality of, of the bread, or at least to the extensibility and the volume uh, of the loaf. So maybe you'll comment on that and let me combine it with another question or two questions which are about nutritional value. Uh, clearly we have several online who are quite keen on the nutritional value uh, and are asking whether you've looked at zinc and iron and what, uh, what this might do for human health if we were to include uh, these these um, blends that would increase the nutritional value, particularly with respect to zinc and iron. Uh, so some comments on these two questions, please. So thank you very much again. I'll start with the nutritional one. We also went and uh, looked at the changes in the micronutrient properties since we already saw an increasing amount of total ash which is an indicator for increase of micronutrients. And uh, what we saw is that in all the cases, the zinc increased significantly and the iron content also increased uh, significantly, mm -hmm. meaning that this uh, would increase the amount of uh, uh, iron and zinc that are available. But whether they are bioavailable for absorption, this is another issue because the more you have phenolic compounds, particularly mm -hmm. the brown colored, whatever, the more you create complexing, which might lead to reduce bioaccessibility of this. So probably beyond this, we might need to really look at uh, the digestibility studies, which would include uh, show the mineral bioaccessibility for the different types of blends of our product. But increasingly, as we know in Kenya, anemia is a big problem. We are sitting between 20 to 40 percent in different groups. And for zinc, almost over 75% of the population is actually being zinc deficient. So this is a step in the right direction if we can demonstrate they are bioavailable. In terms of uh, volumes, I think we can still go slightly higher than 20 to 25, and in some cases to 30, but we need to use uh, amylases and enzymes which affect uh, flour extensibility characteristics. This has been demonstrated by companies who actually do fly improvers. And I think in the next iteration, if we can actually add very small amounts of enzymes, amylases, then we can actually go beyond 20 without doubt. The question would be, how does the sensorial characteristics uh, remain? So I think it's something we can do beyond this to demonstrate where we would go. 
thank you back to you okay no thanks, okay, thanks. Maybe, yeah go ahead go ahead please yeah and maybe just to add to what professor Sila has said so we started off with the main goal being uh reducing the over reliance on um on on imports imported wheat as well as boosting these other crops so it, it wasn't mainly a nutrition that's why we are going up to 10 percent because we are not are targeting a premium product. It's just the usual quick based products. Uh, so we are targeting the normal products that are being uh, consumed. But I think one thing we are picking from the consumers is that they already perceive, and especially millet, as a more nutritious product. So in the future, we could also try uh, niche products. Like uh, we can go as high as 80%. So for people who do not care too much about the taste or about the color, but they're willing to <laughs> sacrifice that for nutrition. So yes, that can be explored. Yeah, maybe there's a small market for people who don't care about the taste, but uh, I, I personally, I don't think there's a, a big market for that one, but uh, certainly there is opportunity for, for increasing and varying the blends and trying new things. So so that's that's creating a lot of excitement. Since you mentioned consumers and and the panels, there there is a question maybe for Francisca uh, about the gender composition of those twelve hundred uh, and eighty one participants that you interviewed. So can you tell us what was the the gender composition between them? Okay, um, thanks for the question. Um, um, surprisingly, we had uh, a balance across the two genders. So uh, for females, we had. Um, 952 and for the male participants we had 919 so the difference is not that much yeah okay almost almost half half yes um, yeah very good thanks for that and then coming back to the the issue of color i mean the i think it was sarah who said maybe that uh, there isn't much concern about the color of the bread which may well be uh the case the question is that does this mean that we could switch to whole grain, particularly coming back to the earlier question about refined wheat versus unrefined uh, sorghum and millet flours. Uh, I think there's optimism from this panelist, or sorry, from this participant, uh, that we could propose to use whole grain flours, especially for the millet and the sorghum that might be blended with the wheat. So what, what are your thoughts about using whole grain flours, if not, well, maybe for all of them, but at least for the sorghum and the millet? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good question also because the factors I mentioned, you know, urbanization, um, increasing incomes that has made people move towards wheat, and this is mostly refined wheat. So we are also thinking of uh, non-communicable diseases have gone up. So it's it has become an issue uh, also, and we are thinking uh, of doing a nutrition study in which whole grains would be one of the one of the components. So we are hoping that in the coming years we are going to explore that question because we think it's becoming a concern even for the Kenyan population as people consume uh, processed and refined uh, products. So yeah. Oh yeah, great. Certainly, there are many benefits to whole grain and. Uh, at least from a nutritional perspective, it's uh, desirable, but of course we need to validate that we can make quality products also using these whole grain blends. Uh, here's a question that I find interesting or particularly interesting. Uh, the question reads that you know, sometimes people use fermentation uh, before making flour. Uh, do you expect fermentation uh, will increase the bread volume and nutritional value of the blend? And, and what are your thoughts about fermentation? Uh, in your blending experiments and, and your proposed work? Thank you very much, Kevin. I can uh, react to this one. Fermentation is one of the oldest technologies actually that has been used a lot within the food industry and for the flask. I think a little bit of fermentation or germination of the sorghum and wheat flour, number one, reduces their denutrient contents. Uh, while making the micronutrients bioavailable. So if you are thinking about increasing the bioavailability of iron, zinc, calcium, and another micronutrients that are of public health concern, a little bit of germinating and drying this would really add a lot of, even sprouting, would add a lot of value in terms of the potential bioavailability of minerals. What controls bread volume is the protein content. 
So if the protein content does not have similar characteristics to that of gluten, this will still remain an issue, but this can be addressed with fly improvers. So I see similar trends, but in terms of nutritional improvement, a fermented product would be far much richer, far much more uh, nutritious compared to a non-fermented product. So this is a possibility, but the technology there also requires a little bit more pre-processing steps before getting to there, which is one step which might require making the product a little bit more expensive. Okay, well, we so, don't want, most of us don't want more expensive, but I think we do want some of the other benefits you mentioned, uh, particularly about anti-nutrients and such. And since you mentioned uh, gluten, there is a question about gluten. Uh, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear from you. Uh, what about the gluten quality of the blend? Uh, what happens to the gluten quality when you when you blend with sorghum or, or millet? So I think yeah, the more you reduce the amount of uh, protein content, which is largely for wheat, uh, the gluten content, you reduce the extensibility behavior of uh, the product. You reduce the festing properties. And this is uh, why that actually what affects uh, the quality of the product negatively. So if you really work with the um, flour with the maybe 16% uh, um, protein content, this will reduce significantly. But if you are working with a product with about 12% uh, protein, that is wheat flour, which is more like the dual purpose flour, this will affect the uh, bread volume significantly. So in any case, I think sorghum and millet do not have gluten, which is actually the protein that is required to allow uh, increase in volume and which controls this. And this is why with the, I will call it fly improvers, then you can really improve this. In maize, they have tried actually to create this with the protein code there. And uh, this has been actually been produced with the uh, treating maize with the hydroperoxide at small amounts. And what that gives, it gives its characteristics similar to that of uh, uh, wheat which is something which can be also explored for sorghum and millet also. Back to you. Okay, no, th th yeah, thank, thanks for that answer. It, it's it's um, actually confirmed my, my, my impressions and thanks for, for sharing that with us. Uh, here, here's a question that's close to my heart because I like cakes and cookies. Uh, and the question is, what about cakes and cookies? Uh, they might work with more proportion of sorghum and millet uh, instead of what, what you're talking now, 10%. Uh, blend for making bread. So what about for making cakes and cookies? I think for cakes and uh, cookies, uh, based on previous experience, uh, experiments I've seen with the uh, students, you can go up to 50% without trouble. We've even replaced, uh, in some cases, with bean, bean flour, and we've been able to really move up to 70% for noodles uh, when replaced with the uh, bean. We only need a, a small amount of hydrocolloid, uh, pectin or guagam to increase the pesting properties because I think that the ability to cling together also gets reduced with increasing. But uh, up to 50%, I can assure you, you have no problem with biscuits, with cookies. For cakes, probably slightly smaller. I've not done this, but I think my colleagues have done it. Okay, so we're going to have healthier cakes and cookies. That sounds good to me. Uh, okay, I, I, it's time to wrap up. I have one quick question for all the panelists, but before I ask that final closing question, uh, I do want to thank uh, each of you, uh, beginning with Dr. Dayakar Rao. I don't know if you're still online, but thank you for trying so hard to, to share your experience with us. Uh, I'm very sorry we weren't able to make it happen, and we'll try for another opportunity. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Daniel Sila, uh, Dr. Sarah Kariuki and Dr. Francisca Ndinda for sharing with us these interesting uh, blending experiments and, and this really exciting discussion about it. Uh, and as we close in the last minute, just a quick yes or no from each of the panelists. Do you think that we will see more and more blended flour and that it will be preferred by consumers over the whole wheat flour in Kenya and in Eastern Africa? So will it be taking over the market? Yes or no? Over to you, uh, Professor Daniel, yes or no? It's a big yes for me, and I'm part of the people who believe it, because okay, I think this is almost true. law in Kenya. 
Dr. Francisca, is, is this the future? Yes or no? It's a yes for me from my experience. Right, too. <laughs> Sarah, what do you say? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you so much, panelists. I look forward to eating blended flour breads uh, in the near future here in Kenya. Uh, thank you all of you who joined us online uh, for this uh, interesting conversation. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you uh, at our next webinar series uh, on dryland crops, uh, and in this case, millets and flowers. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your day or evening, as the case may be. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Goodbye.